My name is Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you to our Monday Thursday service. Whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online, welcome. What are we to say? And if we were to speak, what words would those be? I'm finding myself pulled to listen tonight. To not rush to knowing what to say, to not rush to asserting my authority in any way, but to be quiet, to listen, to wonder, to be open. Welcome to a service where we're not in control and we've come together to worship. Oh, one other thing. As this is a Monday, Thursday service, we will be ending with foot washing in the chapel. The chapel from here is straight across the courtyard, kind of around the building, and there it will be. Uh, if you're not entirely comfortable with foot washing, go anyway. Go. Try something. You won't be in control. You'll be safe. Jesus washed the disciples' feet, a ministry of service. He lifted up the servant. We will be having foot washing after this service in our chapel. Please stand for our call to worship. We are gathered to recall the night when Jesus, the Lamb of God, was betrayed. Are you ready to come to the feet of Christ, whose life was poured out for you? By the grace of God, we are. Can you watch while Jesus prays in the garden? By the grace, grace of, of God, God, we can. can. Will you follow Jesus even into the night of betrayal. By, By the, the grace, grace of God, God we can. God. Then let us praise God, even in the hours of darkness. God, God of all grace and steadfast love, greatly is your name to be praised in all the earth. My 
Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Thank you, and please be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 26, verses 14 through 16. And then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? They counted out for him 30 pieces of silver, and from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. Mm -hmm. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me, and all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. Mm -hmm. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. You have led me through the fire. You are close like no other. I've known you as a friend. And I'm with lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my life. You have been faithful, <laughs> and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything, oh Lord. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Lay down. I surrender now. Give me everything, oh Lord. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me, oh. In all my life, you have been faithful. So, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life. 
if you have been so, so good. And every prayer that I am able, I will sing. Oh God, I got to sing. Oh my goodness, oh my God, oh yes, I got to sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. They became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who had dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the, that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. We are grateful for the gift of Scripture. In the morning, when I in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, just give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. All this year, just give me Jesus. When I am alone, oh, when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, Jesus. Jesus, give me Jesus. When I come to die, oh, when I come to die. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, Jesus, give me Jesus, give You can have all this world. You can have 
all this world you can have all this world We continue reading from Matthew chapter 26. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd of people with swords and clubs from the chief, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once they came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. We are grateful for the gift of Scripture. Now behold. Now behold the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God, who bore all my sins that I may live again, the precious Lamb of God. Holy. Holy. Lamb of God, oh, why? why you love me so, Lord, I shall never know the precious Lamb of God. Now I behold the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God. to sin that I may live again is the precious Lamb of God. When I was always doing right, I went left when he told me to go right. But I'm standing right here in the midst of my tears. Lord, you are the precious Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the Lamb. The precious, precious Lamb of God. The precious Lamb of God. Oh, oh, oh. Because, because of your, your grace, Lord, I can finish, I can finish the, race. the race. The precious Lamb of God. Even when I broke, broke your heart, my sin just tore us apart. But no, no, I'm standing right here in the midst of all my tears, Lord, and I claim you to be the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. The precious Lamb of God. Oh my God, because 
because of you. Ooh, because, because of your grace, grace I can finish the race. The precious Lamb of Thank you so much. This church is so richly blessed with musical talent. And tonight is one of those very special opportunities that we have to be able to blend musicians from both services. So we have wonderful contributions from our 9 o'clock traditional and then our 10.30 modern service. Thank you, Larisha and KT, Ashley, Lisa, and Alex. Makes such a huge addition. So we started out our Lenten journey this year on Ash Wednesday, exploring what reconciliation means and how that can challenge some of the central ways that we understand how to be the church. Recall how we explored the ways Lent is a time when we can step back as a church and ask ourselves, are we hurting or are we helping others? On Ash Wednesday, we began the conversation how the church is a reflection and an embodiment of the way that the Trinity itself illustrates communion and community through God's relationship to the world, by the actions of originating, reconciling, and sustaining. These three Trinitarian movements correspond to the three main functions of the church, worship, mission, and discipleship, which include all ages of church membership, and as we journey through Lent, we have been shaped by the life, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ, as our guide for what God's mission for the world looks like in human terms, what it looks like lived out in a human life. And that mission was not something tangential to the life of the church, but actually at its center, since it clearly embodies who we know Jesus to be. If the church is the body of Christ, and Jesus incarnated God's mission of healing, rescuing, protecting, restoring, and reconciling, then mission is how we live out what being the body of Christ is. And Jesus' mission of incarnating God's mission of reconciliation would inevitably bring him to Jerusalem, the religious center of his community. And so we continue that conversation tonight within the narrative of events that happened in Holy Week. Our exploration tonight in part two of this sermon series that began on Ash Wednesday is into the meaning of Holy Week and it will continue tomorrow night on Good Friday. But these are not regular Sunday morning worship services. They ask much more of us as followers of Jesus. These Holy Week services challenge it, us to put ourselves back into the lives of Jesus' companions, his disciples, his friends, his family, and followers during those last crucial days and hours of his ministry and his life on earth. Holy Week 
is not a time of easy answers or good feelings. It is not a time when the gospel can be summarized on a wristband or a t-shirt, a baseball hat. Tonight and tomorrow night are not for casual Christians. A casual approach to being a Christian means that Easter is mostly about bunnies, baskets, new clothes, family dinners. And for kids, that's fine. But for non-casual Christians, the ones who want to be serious about putting their faith into daily practice, Easter Sunday really doesn't make any sense unless you have allowed yourself to experience the rest of Holy Week leading up to it. The power of resurrection only happens when you really feel and understand what you are resurrected from. Then the promise and miracle of resurrection become real for our struggles in life today. Tonight we gather to worship in a special service that we call Monday Thursday. It gets its name from the Latin word mandatum, which means commandment. That commandment that Jesus shared with his friends in that last meal, to love one another. This is the heart of God's mission of reconciliation because without loving one another, nothing can be reconciled. But Monday Thursday is not a celebration. It's a commemoration. Indeed, Holy Week is for a different type of Christian, one that we might call practicing. And I rather like this term, practicing, because as a drummer, it reminds me of three things that we need to do it daily that we can always improve, and that there'll always be somebody next to us helping us be humble because they'll be doing it better. And as practicing Christians, one of the most difficult things to face in our walk with Jesus is betrayal. Both the ways in which we are betrayed and the ways in which We betray others. But if we want to be real in our discipleship and in our commitment to God's mission, we can't pretend that it isn't there. And when we look at the story of Jesus' life and ministry, this is the week that betrayal drives the narrative. And of course, that means we need to take a closer look at how it happens and who symbolizes it for us. And that's Judas. Now, I want to remind everyone that this message tonight is a particular way of looking at Matthew's account of Jesus' last days. It's an interpretation that I hope will be helpful to your own ways of thinking about your faith and practice as a friend of Jesus. But if it's not, that's okay. There are many ways to read and understand Scripture through our traditions as Christians. And Methodism is a tradition that invites people to consider what they believe and ask why, and to reflect on how their faith seeks greater understanding. I'm going to suggest that we consider Judas could be the third most important character in Matthew's gospel after Jesus and Mary. 
He certainly is one of the most important people in the events that lead us to this moment in Jesus' life. But he is perhaps the most misunderstood and misused as well. His name is synonymous with religion. Judas is the Greek variant of Judah. So right away, we can see how in Matthew, the most Jewish of our four Gospels, we have a central character that literally symbolized the nation of Judah, the hope of the Jewish people in their struggles against foreign adversaries and occupiers from Babylon, Persia, Alexander the Great, to Rome. But as readers, too often we recoil from seeing the events of Jesus' life through Judas' eyes. We don't want to take that step. He revulses us. We want to deny him even more than we deny Jesus. Maybe because Denying Judas keeps our eyes off the way we deny Jesus. We want to believe that he is the other, someone completely alien to us. That he is the monster we could never be. We want to demonize him. We want to scapegoat him. We want to satisfy ourselves that his death is deserved. That he received his just punishment for God, for his blasphemy and betrayal. But hold on, isn't that exactly what the Sanhedrin were trying to do with Jesus? Matthew shines a light on Judas in his account because there is no other way to understand the depth of reconciliation without being buried in betrayal. When we take away Judas' humanity, when we turn him into the unredeemable villain, into the murderer of Jesus, how does that not lead to anti-Semitism in our theology? And one unchangeable truth about human beings We fear what we don't understand, and we kill what we fear. But flattening Judas into a two-dimensional caricature of the Jewish people would have been the farthest thing from Matthew's intent. Remember, for Matthew, Jesus came to fulfill Torah, not replace it. No, for Matthew... Judas' role in Jesus' story is much more significant and important than we are willing to recognize. Rather than being his enemy, Judas saw himself as one of Jesus' most dedicated disciples. He loved Jesus. There is no way he would have followed Jesus for three years, eating with him, sleeping on the ground with him, living a hand-to-mouth existence with him if he didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah and also be ready to give his life for him at any time. Judas saw himself as a loyal soldier of God, working with Jesus to bring about the liberation of God's people from the evil that was Rome in order to fulfill God's promises and hopes of salvation. He saw Jesus as the key to this revolution. The long-promised son of David who was anointed by God and filled with extraordinary wisdom and vision as a leader. Whose teachings, and theological insight were unmatched. 
But to Judas, Jesus was not only an intellectual. He was a rabbi of action. A Messiah that could work miracles, feed the crowds, heal the injured, bring sight to the blind, raise the dead, and yes, free the prisoners from their chains and proclaim release to the captives, overthrowing the oppressors just as Scripture had foretold and as Jesus himself claimed he was there to fulfill. Judas believed. He was in this freedom movement that Jesus led 150%. No, Judas Judas was not a man of weak faith. As Jonathan reminded us a few sermons ago, Judas was a zealot, and his name Iscariot meant that he was a Sakari, a dagger man, a trained elite member of the zealots who was prepared to use violence if necessary, to remove traitors who capitulated to Rome and undermined the salvation of the Jews from their oppressors. The Sakari were always on the lookout for collaborators. Let us try to imagine what Judas might have been experiencing in Matthew's account. Let us see if we can look at Jesus through Judas' eyes in this story. The entry into Jerusalem is what Judas had been waiting for all his life. We can only guess at the excitement Judas must have felt on Palm Sunday when they finally came to Jerusalem. In Judas's mind, he'd been pushing Jesus probably for over a year. Dude, we got to get to Jerusalem. We have to get this started. Why are we wandering around the hills? The action is in Jerusalem. And now, here he was, finally, after three years, coming into the city. He knew that this is the moment Scripture would reveal itself and the people would rally around Jesus as their Messiah. The stones would cry out. The Romans would be caught off guard. The centurions would be overwhelmed. Pontius Pilate would be driven into exile. Israel would be free. And God's glory would be known throughout the empire in their deliverance. Overthrowing Rome would show that the polytheism of Rome was finally exposed as false. And the emperor would cower beneath the infinite power and strength of the one almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then Monday came. And Jesus did very little but hang out and talk and eat. And then Tuesday came with some miracles and teachings but everything is still way too chill. There's a tension in the air. Everyone can feel the excitement. Everyone is waiting. The only one who's not tense is Jesus. Judas thinks to himself, what is going on? Something was wrong. They were losing their window of opportunity. They needed to send the signal now. This was Passover, the time when God's deliverance of the Hebrew people was experienced not just in the past, but also in the present. This is the time when the revolution had to begin. Why was Jesus waiting? 
Judas asks himself, Jesus, what are you doing? So for Judas, if Jesus wasn't going to act, then Judas would. He would force Jesus into being the leader he knew that he was. Or, what if he wasn't? Either way, Judas couldn't wait any longer. He had to accelerate the plan to take advantage of this Passover window by bringing the authorities to Jesus. Either way, something had to give. Either this would trigger Jesus to fight and lead the people to rise up, or it wouldn't. And Jesus would be shown to be a coward, not worthy to be the Messiah after all. And if this was the case, then better the people see it now rather than follow Jesus to their slaughter against the Roman legions if Jesus can't summon an army of angels. All that mattered was the movement. And the movement needed this moment. Judas had been the brains of the disciples for three years. Their chief operating officer, managing their budget and their daily needs, taking care of their logistical concerns. Now he needed to be the catalyst for why they had followed Jesus in the first place. He needed to be the one to take the necessary action. That's what he was trained for. That's why he was a Sakari, a dagger man for God. Now Judas thinks to himself, Peter may have been the biggest of the disciples, but I'm the strongest because I'm the only one capable of making the hard decisions, of keeping the movement on task, keeping it focused on the goal, the salvation of their people. He would reveal Jesus to the authorities with a kiss, something only a friend would do because he knew Jesus would understand. So he sees Jesus in the garden and approaches him. The soldiers follow him. Jesus greets him in a low voice, but with compassion and acceptance. Friend, do what you are here to do. And again, we can imagine hearing Judas's voice as he leans forward, kissing Jesus and whispering in his ear, now is our last chance, Jesus. I am begging you, do it now. Then Judas steps back and watches. And fear and panic grip him as he starts to doubt. And he thinks, because if you don't do it, then you are the one who's betraying me and everything I did for you for three years. You are the one who is betraying your people by giving them false hopes. You are the one, Jesus, who is betraying God, not me. When he sees Jesus is not resisting, but allowing himself to be arrested, his heart explodes with despair. Everything we have built is gone. It's over. My God, Jesus, what are you doing? Oh my God, what have I done? In that garden, on that night, both Jesus and Judas struggled with betrayal. Judas's faith was not weak, but it was tragically misdirected. Judas is not our scapegoat, and he should never be a reason to scapegoat anyone else, much less a whole religion. Judas 
loved Jesus, but he couldn't reconcile Jesus' failure to be the Messiah he expected. Rather, for Matthew, Judas is our voice, our fear of failure, our betrayal of God, our need to fix the situation, even if that means betraying others in return by any means necessary. Judas shows us our inability to reconcile the way God reconciles. The brilliance of Matthew is how this text challenges all of us to see Jesus and ourselves through Judas's eyes. Matthew's text forces us to ask ourselves, is our faith powerful but yet misdirected? How would we know? Do we really understand who Jesus is? How Jesus really saves the world? Do we really know how to be a partner with God in God's mission of reconciliation? How to worship and be a disciple in the way that Jesus showed us? Can we live with ourselves being betrayed and still love anyway? Can we live with ourselves being the betrayer and still love anyway. Friend, do what you are here to do. We are going to move into communion. We are a United Methodist congregation. What that means in this instance is that you are welcome at this table. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to have a set of beliefs. There's no checklist. There's nowhere you have to sign your name. The invitation is a simple one. Will you come to the Lord's table that he might speak to you? Will you come and listen to Jesus and see how he might work in you? The communion liturgy is powerful, but there are just a few words that I'm going to speak tonight. See if I can remember them. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. I'm going to offer communion to anyone who would like to come. 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 is given for you. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneel at the feet of his friends. 
silently washes their feet. Master who acts as a slave to them. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are rich and poor. Neighbors are black and white. Neighbors are near and far away. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. These are the we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to The benediction is not one of words. It's one of gestures. It's letting our arms fall open into our lap. We came here to this space to receive. We've received. And we gesture for our heart. We gesture for our mind. We gesture for our belly. We receive the body of Christ. We're